Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session of the Open Education Network's Pub 101. Um, thank you for joining us today. My name is Amanda Herford, and I'm the Scholarly Communications Director for Palney, and I'll be your host and facilitator for today. Um, just a little background about why I'm here and why I wanted to host today. Um, I attended Pub 101 for the first time back in 2019 when our <clears throat> OER publishing program was in its infancy and we were trying to figure out if we could publish and if so, how were we gonna do that? And I learned so much from attending these sessions and from reviewing all the modules. So now I'm serving on the Pub 101 committee with Carla Myers and Amanda Larson and Karen and others. And it's really great to be on the other side today and helping out by facilitating this session. So soon I'll be handing it off to Jackie Frank from Montana State University to talk about accessibility and inclusion in OER. Um, but a few comments just to kind of get us started. Um, so as always, we're gonna leave time for your questions and lots of conversation, hopefully at the end of today's session. And there may be lots of you who actually have experience with this topic, so we definitely ex invite you to share your experience and um, just sort of be part of the conversation and let us know, um, you know, what resources you use and how you have approached this topic in the past. Um, so a few housekeeping details. Um, this webinar is being recorded and it's going to be added to the Pub 101 YouTube list for the spring 2022 cohort. Um, and we are committed to providing a friendly and safe and welcoming environment for everyone um, that is in line with our community norms. So if you could join us in creating a safe and constructive space, that would be wonderful. Um, so for now, uh, that's it for me for now. I'm going to go ahead and hand things over to Jackie to talk about the topic for today, accessibility and inclusion in OER. Great. Thank you. And hello, everyone. I am Jackie Frank, the Instruction and Accessibility Librarian at the Montana State University Library in Bozeman, Montana. And I am really happy to be here with you uh, to talk about accessibility today. And as a reminder, these slides will be linked um, from the course orientation uh, after today's presentation, um, as well as it being recorded. Okay, uh, so today we are going to first acknowledge that there are lots of accessibility challenges. Um, and then we're gonna share some talking points about why accessibility matters so that we can promote the idea of just having an accessibility mindset. Um, and then we're gonna cover, cover some of the specific best practices um, and how to use them, as well as a few accessibility checkers uh, that you might want to use. Then we'll briefly touch on some accessibility considerations for different types um, of different uh, OER documents, um, such as PDF and EPUBs. Finally, we'll share some resources and training options uh, and include any that you might be aware of as well that you want to share with the group. Um, so throughout this, uh, if you want to unmute yourself or type in the chat box to share any information, ask questions, um, or respond to any of the other group questions that might come through, please feel free to do so along the way. I have just a couple different questions. Um, I'd like you to answer this in the chat. Um, but first, I'd like to ask you, what type of institution are you from? University, college, community college, or other? And if it's other, maybe go ahead and throw it in there. So I'm seeing lots of universities, a consortium, state university, colleges, community colleges. Uh, I'll have to add consortia for, for next time because um, that definitely tends to be one. So we definitely, we have a mix um, for sure and from people from all over. So that's, uh, that's kind of what I expected. Um, great. Well, feel free to keep adding in the chat if you haven't yet. Um, but we are going to talk about some of the challenges that no matter where you're at or what type of institution you're at, um, it can be 
a challenge to get authors to create accessible materials sometimes. And uh, Christina will talk a little bit more next week um, about some other challenges as well. Um, but it can be more challenging to get people to create accessible materials than it can be to get them thinking about creating more diverse materials. So um, for what it's worth, uh, accessibility is just something that um, in my experience, it's often because people think of it as kind of an add-on or something to do at the end. So that's why I like to talk about having an accessibility mindset from the beginning. And another one of the biggest challenges that I see is time. I'm sure you're all aware of that, um, both having time to learn about accessibility on the front end, and then the time it takes to um, ensure that your materials are accessible. And then it also never ends because uh, there isn't really such thing as being 100% accessible. Um, and so there are always updates that you can make, but for our purposes, um, we're gonna be talking about having that mindset, knowing some of the best practices, and then some resources to help um, ensure that the content you're getting from different people meets those guidelines. I will say that the extra time it takes to make the documents accessible decreases over time, the more you get used to doing it as an integral part of the process. Um, so that's definitely something uh, that you that you can also share um, with different instructors or different people creating OER um, and know that yourself if you are creating um, open educational resources yourself. Lastly, um, I see many folks fall into a trap of thinking it doesn't have a big impact and therefore it might not be worth the extra time it takes, but we're going to debunk that um, shortly in just a minute. But first, oh, I think I went backwards on my slides. Oh no, I did it. I just, sorry, I thought I was showing this slide first. Um, so as you can see, these were some of the challenges uh, that we just that we just talked about. Okay. Uh, first, I want to briefly outline what we mean by accessibility and how that is different from universal design and inclusive design. Um, and that's going to be situated within the context of what's covered within your unit one um, in Pub 101. So to review the definitions of universal design and inclusive design that are included, um, universal design is the process of creating products that are usable by people with the widest range of abilities, operating within the widest possible range of situations. Inclusive design then means that you're creating a lot of different ways for people to participate so that people, so that as many people as possible feel um, as though they can belong. However, inclusive design doesn't mean designing one thing for all people. They do have, um, or sorry, at first, accessibility then often refers to the design of products, devices, services, and environments to be usable by people with disabilities. So while they do have some differences, um, really, they have a shared goal and that if we think about accessibility, universal design, inclusive design from the beginning, um, it can help design content in a way that users can access more easily, um, which is ultimately the goal of all, all three mindsets. So let's talk about um, how to have an accessibility mindset which does come with an understanding of why accessibility matters and how many people actually benefit from it. But first, uh, next, I want you to answer again in the chat, are you mostly supporting other textbook authors or are you authoring content yourself? Both supporting others. I'll see mostly supporting others, some both, definitely some authoring content though. 
a bit of both, actually supporting. So again, a mix. Great, thank you. Um, ultimately, uh, whether, you know, one of the goals of creating open textbooks is so that they can be accessed by more people with fewer barriers. Uh, so it turns out, oops, sorry. It turns out that one in five or about 19% of undergrad students report having a disability. And about one in four um, or 26% of people in the US live with a disability. However, um, if you really think about it, 100% of people will experience a disability at some time in their life. Um, and that's according to Access Lab. And that's likely sometimes during their education. And that's because disability can be permanent, temporary, or situational. Um, so even having a bad ear infection can limit someone's hearing temporarily. Um, and situational disabilities can range from just being in a loud environment or even to being extremely sleepy, which can impair your focus and performance. And we must also acknowledge and understand that accessibility is a spectrum. There's a huge variety of assistive technologies, um, even down to classes and contacts, um, all the way up to screen readers and mobility and hearing aids. Um, if we obviously cannot cover them all, but if you have um, interesting examples of assistive technology, uh, feel free to share them in, in the chat as well. And because accessibility is a spectrum, what works for one person it doesn't work for another person. And that, again, is a challenge. So ultimately, when we're thinking about um, OER and publishing, providing as many formats as possible is a best practice that allows users to choose what works for them. So we'll see some differences between different documents. Um, but uh, for example, there can be um, different ways that a user would use an EPUB versus a PDF. Um, so offering both options allows the user to choose, again, what works best for them. And uh, that is, that option um, is an option um, when you go to like publish a textbook. Um, it can be done from Google Docs or Word um, and Pressbooks. You can just save it in uh, different, different formats. And ultimately, accessibility benefits everyone in the end. Um, while certain things are designed specifically for people with disabilities, um, for example, curb cuts and automatic door openers were designed uh, for people with uh, mobility aids. But many people use those on a daily basis uh, when we're pushing a shopping cart or a stroller. Um, and for another example, using headers helps structure a document so that users can navigate by section. If someone is um, using a screen reader, they can jump between the headings, but it also helps visual users um, just by breaking up the content as well. Captions help people um, who have hearing impairments, but also allow people to follow along better or watch a video in a noisy environment if they don't have headphones. Uh, transcripts is another one that allows users to read the content without seeing a video. Um, and that could be helpful for some people who don't have really good internet connection or bandwidth. Um, and uh, could also be read using glasses, magnification, a screen reader, braille, or other assistive technology. So by doing these things, it allows all of us um, and all users to benefit. Okay, so let's dig into a few specific accessibility best practices. But first I have our last poll. I wanna ask you how much accessibility um, and or experience do you have? Uh, zero, low, moderate, or advanced? It's moderate, 
low, moderate. Couple zeros in there. No one's saying advanced yet. I feel like people are scared to say they have advanced knowledge. I'm even scared to say I have advanced knowledge sometimes. Um, well, great. Well, uh, even for those of you who have moderate knowledge, hopefully uh, you will learn something new um, and also put some of these, you know, talking points in your back pocket um, if you are helping other people who are publishing. Because ultimately, who's responsible? Generally, the creator of the creator or the author of the content is responsible for meeting accessibility guidelines. However, publishers um, also want to make sure that the content that they publish um, is accessible. That requires knowing at least what to look for and then providing that knowledge and resources back to authors if needed. Um, if you have more support, than that for accessibility, great, that's awesome. Um, but I'm guessing that a lot of you might not. So a lot of it is, again, knowing what to look for, knowing um, these standards, and then sharing uh, this information back with the creator or the author, um, and then working through that process so that you can get an accessible product that then you can publish. So we can't cover them all but we're gonna talk about a lot of the most common best practices from uh, WCAG, oops, and I meant, I thought I updated that, it's 2.1 now, um, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines from W3C. And this is the industry standard. Um, and we are going to start with headings. We're gonna start by talking about headings, hyperlinks, um, color contrast, captions, transcripts, and alt text. So first, let's take a look at headings. Heading styles are a formatting tool. They are used to separate sections of a document or a textbook so that users and screen readers can navigate through the sections quickly. And it helps organize um, the document as well. So the importance of having a well-structured textbook is also covered in your unit one and headings help provide the structure of that textbook. They should be applied in outline format. And so the title of the textbook would be a heading one. Then the next uh, would be like the chapter titles and then any sub chapters or subsections of each chapter would be heading three um, and so on. So you can have, usually you only have one heading one but you can have multiple heading twos. And then under a heading two, you could also have multiple heading threes, um, for example. To do this in Word, um, you simply highlight the information um, and then you can choose the heading style from the top ribbon. Um, Yes, also, um, and um, in Google Docs, um, I'm looking at the chat, there's also headings, um, no matter where you're creating it, um, there will be an option uh, to apply the heading. Usually you just select the text that you want. Um, and then in both Word and in Google Docs, um, it's up on the menu up at the top. Um, and if anyone has other options uh, for other software that they use, please feel free to add it in the chat like you are doing. For hyperlinks, you want the users to know where the link is going to take them um, and avoid pasting the entire long URL, which is often a string of special characters. And you also want to avoid using click here as a link. Um, and instead, you want the link to be like the title of the content itself um, or what the user is going to do. So um, if you would say, you know, go to the Huffington Post 
or you know, then the Huffington Post would be the name of the hyperlink or the text that appears as the hyperlink. Or another example is um, to contact us, have the um, or to email us, have email us actually be the link rather than email us from um, and then giving the link. And again, so for hyperlinks, uh, usually write out what the text you want to appear, highlight that text, right click on it, um, and then there's usually an option to choose a link or a hyperlink, and then you get to put in the URL behind it. And I see um, it down there, does the size of the hyperlink matter? The size of the actual URL that's going behind the text does not matter. The text that you link, um, so the text that appears as the link, you want that to be as short as possible, but that is still descriptive. It can be a few words, definitely. Um, and But what you want to avoid is probably more than one line um, being a hyperlink because if it crosses over um, and is more than one line and they're showed right next to each other, um, it can just get really hard to read with an underline. Um, but if it's a couple words and it crosses a line um, and it, it like wraps the text to the next line, but it's still only a couple words, that's okay. I hope that might, I hope that answers your question. If it confused it more, just let me know. And uh, so when thinking about color, we want to uh, ensure that high color contrast of text and diagrams and charts, um, we just want to ensure that the color contrast is high enough. Um, and also, you don't want to use color alone to convey meaning. So for example, um, if you wanted to highlight an important part of the text, don't just make it a different color of text. You would also want to make it bold. And that's so that if someone was colorblind, um, would also see that emphasis. For color contrast, there are some accessibility checkers um, that can be used to check this. And um, I have those included at the end. If you're just using like straight black and white text or um, like navy blue and white, um, like really um, something that you know is really high contrast, um, then that's okay to start with. But then as you start using more colors, um, then there are some checkers that you can use. Captions benefit people with hearing impairments. Um, and also people who don't have access to audio or people who use English as a second language or in noisy environments um, or quiet environments. And uh, we can generate automatic captions uh, for videos using YouTube. And there are now a lot of other, uh, there are many other software programs that are catching on and integrating transcripts. So um, for, we have live uh, transcription as an option through Zoom um, that users can choose to turn on if they want to. Um, PowerPoint is now offering options, but generally you're gonna be publishing content. So the video content will already be created um, and you just need to ensure that that content um, has the captions as well. And I saw just a question um, here about, um, about color contrast. Is there a standard color used for links? Um, and then seeing more white text on dark backgrounds. Is this an accessibility concern? So I'm gonna jump back and answer those uh, couple questions about color real quick. Standard color used for links? Yes. It is usually blue. The color of blue will sometimes change, but generally you want um, to leave it as blue. If you click on a hyperlink, 
it will sometimes then change the color to denote to a user that you've clicked on it. That I have found less standardization um, of what color it changes to, but the main um, standard color for hyperlink to appear first is blue. And then seeing more white text on dark backgrounds. While this still passes the color contrast, it, some users have um, said that it is hard for them to read. So I would say, while it still passes accessibility guidelines, I would probably avoid um, using a dark color background um, if possible. Users generally have the option um, if they're looking at it on a screen, um, then there's an option to usually uh, toggle to a dark mode. So if a user, if that is helpful for someone, it's usually an option for them, but it doesn't toggle back as easily um, from my understanding. So um, good question. And while it still technically passes accessibility guidelines, I would avoid it, but that's just my personal recommendation based on some feedback I've heard directly from a small number of users. Um, if other people have comments on that, I would love, um, I would love to hear. And then another comment, um, if you use standard red color against a white background in a regular size font, like size 11 or 12, it normally doesn't meet color contrast guidelines. Um, I didn't mention this, but there are, if text is bigger, it doesn't need to have as dark of color contrast um, and according to the checkers. So when text is smaller and it has a different color, it needs a higher contrast. Um, and so when, yeah, it's just a regular size, that standard red doesn't um, often need it. So um, using a darker color or increasing the text size um, would, uh, would be two ways uh, to, to help fix that. Okie dokie. And do I have the RGB for the blue color? I do not actually. Um, but I could look that up. I'll try to, um, I will try to do that. Jackie, it looks like later in the chat um, that was mm -hmm. made available, Leanne put it, it Perfect, okay. I'm trying to scroll through um, pretty quickly. Let me know if I am missing any questions, but I think I have covered um, most of them. There's one more at the end here. Doesn't uh, bolding rather than using a heading make a difference for screen readers? Yes. So you can, um, a lot of people kind of fake headers. And so they will make the text a bigger size and bold it so that it, to a visual user, it appears like a heading. But if you don't actually select the text and then choose um, the heading style, either in Word or Google Docs, then it doesn't select it doesn't designate it as a heading to a screen reader. So um, you do need to specifically designate it um, as a header. And if you're in Word or, um, or even you know, Google Docs, the normal, it defaults to what is called normal um, format. And you just need to change that to a header. And I can try to, um, I didn't want to show all of these um, little examples just for time, and a lot of you probably um, know how to do it somewhat already, but I can try to share um, some of these specific steps and show an example at the end. And yes, doesn't it designate as emphasis for a screen reader to bold? Um, it does. When you bold the text, it does designate that to a screen reader and it um, makes sure that the user knows that it is emphasized text. So yes, um, thank you for clarifying um, if I misunderstood your original question. Okay, other, other questions? I'll try to keep an eye on the chat. Um, 
coming back to captions, uh, we kind of went through um, a lot of these, but I also uh, saw that there was a tool um, placed in the chat as well for captions. Just a couple of tips about captions. If you are creating the content yourself, speaking clearly, slowly, and close to the microphone will really help your captions so that you don't have to edit them um, as much later. If you are creating your own captions, you do want to go through and edit them afterwards um, and just make sure that they are accurate. They are getting much more accurate and are doing a really good job, um, but sometimes punctuation or especially names, sometimes in capitalization can be off um, or spelling, spelling of names specifically. And going wrong way, transcripts uh, are, a, are separate from captions and they benefit people uh, with vision impairments or people who don't have access to video. They are a separate written document and they do not have to necessarily be verbatim accounts of the spoken word. Um, they're usually very, very close. Um, but they can be written out beforehand. So they may not be the exact same as the captions um, of a recorded video. But the, tra the transcripts um, are searchable by all users. And so that can be really helpful in, um, like, especially in educational materials, if you have something and you wanna search for a term or a specific part in a video, uh, that can be really helpful as well. Alt text is a written description of an image and it serves several functions. It is read by screen readers in place of images and it's also displayed in browsers if the image file doesn't load properly um, or if the user has chosen not to view images and that might be because they have limited internet or bandwidth. And alt text. To add alt text, most often you add the image, right click, and then there's an option to add alternative text. When you're adding your descriptions, uh, try to consider the context. Is it purely decorative? You may be able to, um, you may want to mark it as decorative, depending, um, or sorry, you may be able to specifically mark it as decorative, depending on what software you're using. Um, or you can put in um, an option, which is a quote space quote, put that in the text. Um, and you put that in um, the placeholder of the alt text and that would essentially uh, skip the image. That is only if it's decorative and it doesn't provide any context. So oftentimes that's like a logo um, or something. If a logo is repeated on every single page, a user would not want alt text to be read out every single page for that logo. Um, so you could skip that. If it does add context or information, um, then you want to actually put in some um, useful alt text. You want to be concise. Usually it's about one or two sentences. That's for a normal image. Charts, charts need to be longer often. But you don't um, want to repeat information that's provided elsewhere. So if it's talking about the image and the text um, and it shares some information, you don't need to repeat that ever. You also want to try to be objective. You don't want to interpret or analyze the image. Um, you just want to be as kind of objective as possible. That can help with being concise as well. And then trying to apply the same writing style uh, as well as the surrounding text. If it's a really scientific document, um, your alt text might be more scientific. If it is, um, 
you know, a writing textbook and it's more creative writing, for example, and then there's an image, uh, you can be maybe a little bit more creative with your writing style. And then describing charts and graphs, um, this one gets a little bit more complicated. There are a couple different options. If it's pretty simple, try to just like share the information that is in the chart or the graph that is trying to be um, shared with the user. Another option, if it's just really complicated and too much, um, you can describe it and then link um, to the full tables, the full data tables um, from the text or in an appendix as well. There may be some questions about um, alt text, but you guys already did. Uh, you had the option to do a homework assignment um, to write alt tags for one of the images um, in the open textbook. And so I'm gonna try to come back at the end um, and share, just look at some of those comments and share some feedback um, and look at those together. But I don't wanna get derailed for time. Um, and so yes, that was linked in the chat as well. So if you want to test your hand and you haven't yet, uh, there are a couple different options where you can go. And, um, and then I will go through and try to give you um, specific feedback by writing a comment uh, back to you. So if you would like to and haven't yet, feel free to do that. Okay, so now I wanna quickly note that there are many different formats of open textbooks. And they can include PDF, EPUBs, audiobooks, press books, many, many more. Um, they all have different accessibility considerations. Some have the ability to enlarge text, reflow content um, based on like screen width size, and um, whether multiple columns are supported. But ultimately, um, one of the things I mentioned earlier, one of the main takeaways is that you can usually save the textbook in multiple formats from the original document. Um, and that's uh, best to provide as many options as possible. So for example, EPUB, which is short for electronic publication, and online or HTML versions have certain advantages over PDFs. They can increase in um, or resize the text size. The text content will be uh, reflowed if it is uh, changed, if the text is changed. And uh, the, it will also change based on the browser or window width, whether you're on a mobile device or on a laptop. Um, and it can also allow users to change even font colors for contrast. Um, and they both support vector images, again, that get resized. PDFs is one of the most common formats, and it's created for the benefit of working universally across software and hardware. Um, it stands for portable document format, if you didn't know that. Uh, and while it's hard to make PDFs fully accessible to screen readers, um, it, you can definitely. Um, but PDFs do still have different advantages, including that they can maintain the original visual layout, which can be helpful um, for sighted users or um, good for printing. Um, and sometimes um, they can also sometimes reduce the file size um, as well. So if someone is trying to load a document with lower bandwidth, um, and then they can be available offline as well. So, like I said, the takeaway, you know, try to offer as many formats as possible. Um, and here is, try to share one example um, of one within the open textbook library. Um, and you can see that there are many different formats available. Um, so this is a really good option. And now I am no longer in Full screen, ah, there it goes, okay. 
I'm also going to just speed through really quickly some basic info on accessibility checkers um, because I want to make you aware of your existence, um, of their existence, and rather than fully understand each one, um, but they are really great resources. Um, and then uh, there are tons of resources on how to use each one out there as well. Word um, and Adobe Pro both have built-in accessibility checkers. In Word, uh, you can open your document, click File, check for issues, and then check accessibility. Uh, and a sidebar pops up. It gives you kind of instructions on how to walk through everything. And those instructions are actually pretty easy to use most of the time. Um, so I've been pretty impressed with, uh, with how they tell people to try to fix things. Adobe Pro also has um, a built-in accessibility checker. You, and again, this is Adobe Pro, so not um, the free version, but you would um, open your document. If needed, um, you could add the action wizard to the toolbar. And then you just click action wizard and make accessible. And it walks you through all of these different prompts. Um, and again, then a sidebar will pop up, will tell you different errors. The PDF instructions, I will say, um, aren't always as useful as the Word instructions have been, but I've had pretty good luck um, either using the instructions that they send me directly to um, or just going and doing a general web search um, for using the part of the accessibility checker um, that I'm using in Adobe. And there are also checkers for online resources and um, HTML. So if it is an online, uh, an online document, the WAVE accessibility checker is my favorite. You have two options. You can either go directly to wave.webaim.org and paste in the URL um, that you want to evaluate. Or you can get a plugin um, and then you just pull up the page and then there's um, on your web browser, there would be a little uh, a button where the plugin and you click it and it brings up again, a sidebar um, showing you all the, the different errors and errors or considerations um, as well. Totally is also a browser extension. This one, I really like totally. Um, I think it's great. And again, either on Chrome, Firefox, um, Safari, whatever browser you're using, um, just go and search for totally extension and then you'll add it to your browser. And then again, any page that you're on, you just go up um, and click the little button in your browser and uh, it brings up uh, uh, a menu at the bottom that then brings up a sidebar. If anyone has used those, or if you have other um, accessibility checkers the, uh, that you really like or have worked really well, um, please put them in. And while these are helpful tools, they don't always check everything. So the color contrast, um, more tools are starting to try to add color contrast into their checkers, but not all of them. Um, so I, I think Word is trying to now, but it depends on the version of Word that you have. Um, and it sometimes it will flag if you're using headers, and maybe you skipped a heading level. So you have a heading two and then you have a heading four under heading two. It'll tell you that there's no heading three there. But if you just have a really long document and no headers are used, it won't always flag that. Um, so again, these are great, great tools, but you still um, need to know kind of what to look for yourself. Um, and I would recommend looking through the document yourself first, um, just with your knowledge 
and then using a checker um, at the end kind of as a final step. And I do have, um, I, meant to, I meant to put on this slide another, specifically a color contrast checker. Um, I do have a link to a specific color contrast checker. It's one that you download of the software, um, but then it, it does work really well. Um, so I will try to share that with you guys um, as well. But if you have other suggestions, uh, let me know. Okay, lastly, uh, we only have just a couple more slides, but I wanted to end by really kind of just talking about self-care. We have covered a ton of information in a small amount of time. You may or may not have already known a lot of this information, but it's still a lot to um, just think about and be aware of on top of all of the other uh, work that you guys are doing. Uh, so we can't be perfect at everything. Um, and honestly, perfection is not really the goal. Um, we know that 100% accessible doesn't really even exist. So thinking about accessibility as a great first step um, and then learning and incorporating new skills um, always takes time. So just try to be compiled, uh, kind to yourself, um, practice self-compassion and, and also just share that with others um, along the way. So if you are help supporting others um, through that content or through the publishing side, um, you know, just trying to share that compassion as well. It is a learning process. We do have some resources here. Um, these slides will be shared. So we wanted to compile some of the resources for you. Um, a lot of the resources are already linked in your Pub 101, Unit 1, um, including some really good information on creating alt text descriptions and um, a checklist for accessibility. And then uh, there are also some resources for me. We, I have a, one kind of main libguide uh, that uh, these instructions for creating accessible documents um, are on that libguide that has other uh, resources for you as well. This is a very long um, URL. I had it in a bit.ly, but it wasn't working. I don't know what I did wrong. So I'm going to try to copy and paste that into the chat. Um, but if you could give me some feedback, um, I would love it. And this is under Creative Commons license. Uh, the slides are, so I included that at the end. Um, what questions do you have? Jackie, there is a question in the chat. And by the way, thank you so much for all of that great content. You gave us some great background information and um, um, some really great tools. And I know that personally, it's going to be really helpful for me. So thanks again. Um, Melissa is asking, Am I correct that when saving from Word to PDF, using the free version of Adobe can result in not all accessibility features coming over to the PDF? And is it crucial to use the save as Adobe PDF and not other options for saving as PDF? So kind of the process from going Word to PDF. Yes, um, that is a good question. And um, I'm not, I'll first preface this by I'm not a, an expert on, um, on this. I could learn more and dive into the nuances, um, but my understanding is that that is correct. I have seen um, sometimes very frustratingly, even PDFs that people have tried to make um, accessible. And then if someone opens them with just like the free version of Adobe, not all of those tags, um, and different things, the accessibility features don't always come along with it. Um, so that is, I have seen that. I honestly don't understand all of the nuances why, um, but yes, I believe when the, whenever you see, so in Word, there are kind of two options. You can just do a file save and then manually like change the, file format to PDF 
and do that. That I believe is what often does not transfer some of the accessibility um, con backend content. Um, if you do ever see an option that is save as Adobe PDF, as you referred to in the question, that is generally the best option to use because generally that has been something where they have worked specifically with Adobe to offer that option. Um, and then Adobe has tried to make sure that as much as possible comes through. I've still seen, I, I don't wanna say that it 100% like works, um, I'm, but it is a better option. Um, if anyone else has more information on that, it actually is something that I've been needing to, to look into a little bit. Um, if I find anything different, I will certainly pass on that information and let you know. Um, but if anyone else has more information on that. Um, I think Leanne yeah. might have something to pass along or another question. Um, actually, yes, I just wanted to chime in on the PDF conversation because I'm an instructional designer, so I work with this. I try to Great. stay away from PDFs because they're the bane of my existence. <laughs> um, but <laughs> um, as I put in the chat, you know, the big tip is if you're working with Word or Google as your source doc, if you're going to create a PDF from that, you definitely want to run the checkers and try to make your document as accessible as possible before you do that conversion. Because once it's in PDF form to remediate anything, it, it's it's very tedious and complicated. And um, I try to stay far, far away from it. But when you're working in Word, especially, there's a couple of different ways. If you do have the pro or the paid version of Adobe, you can install the Adobe ribbon into Word. And that's going to create the best possible source doc for you. Now, if you're working with the free version of Adobe, um, still run the checker in Word first and everything. But when you go to convert it, you want to make sure you're using the save as PDF option, not the print to PDF option. If you, you, if you use the print to PDF option and it kind of, you, you choose, that's basically the printer that you're choosing, then it basically creates a scanned copy, kind of like you took it to your, your Xerox machine and scanned it in as a PDF and it's basically an image and Adobe will pick up nothing of any of the accessible features that you embedded into that document. So save to PDF or save as PDF is gonna be your best option. And there are some additional menu choices uh, that talks about the tags and whatnot. So I think I put in chat a couple bubbles up about, um, there's a the resource page from Word that walks you through that save as PDF um, process. Um, but that's what I know about it. But as far as remediating PDFs, I know very, very little. <laughs> Yeah, that is, is such helpful comments. Um, I, have, I should have mentioned that first, like make sure that your Word document is as accessible as possible um, and then save it to PDF. That is great advice. Um, and then also, um, you know, coming back to the multiple formats thing, um, if you do have, um, you still want your PDFs to be as accessible as possible. Um, so still following all those guidelines, running the checkers. Um, but if you do also have a secondary option, you know, a PDF and an EPUB, for example, um, then if someone really needs all of those uh, different tags and things, then they can choose a different, a different format. Um, yes, thank you very much, Leanne, for that answer to that question. We've got another question in the chat. Um, do you have any examples of how to deal with complex images, like an actual textbook with a complex chart and how the author dealt with alt text for that? or a website with a complex image, a faculty PowerPoint with complex tabular data, et cetera? Good question. Um, I am actually going to, hmm, I think the best is probably still to be in slideshow mode, but I'm gonna go backwards to, sorry for the flashing. If uh, Close your eyes if you don't like flashing um, really quick. And I'm gonna go back to the alt text. Um, homework page and bring up the homework. Um, granted, because this has um, a range of images, um, including a chart. And so it's not the most complex chart, but it's still a pretty good example. So I'm going to scroll through um, this document here. Um, and here, let's see, can I make my screen a little bit bigger? 
making it a little bit bigger, but kind of doing some weird formatting things. So, um, so here is a chart, for example. This is kind of a good one that, you know, it can get kind of complex. Um, and so I actually tried um, my hand and then I looked at the suggested alt text of this. Um, they were surprisingly similar. So I was actually quite happy um, about that from my perspective um, because alt text, I will just say it's, um, it's a challenge um, and it can be subjective, but here is one. Um, and so the example alt text, if I right click and pull up the alt text is, I'll try to show it, even though it's grayed out in the background, um, the, at the top here, it says college attendance demographics, only a fraction of the nation's 18 million undergraduates are traditional students. So that to me is saying like, that's the main takeaway that they want you to get from this chart. They put it in the title. So the alt text here starts with that. Only a fraction of the nation's 18 million are traditional students. And then it tries to be as concise, but as specific as possible to give the rest of the information. 7.5 million two-year students, 2.4 million part-time students at four-year schools, 0.9 million for profit students, 2.2 over the age of 21, and 5.2 million traditional students. So that's basically just listing then the specific numbers and the legend um, entries. So I thought that was a pretty good one um, and a pretty good example of how there's a lot visually going on, but it can still be condensed to a fairly short alt text. Um, so that was a good one. Um, and Jackie, is it, sake of time, sorry, go ahead. Is it important to also have a title for the chart? It depends. So for example, um, the title of this chart is actually in the text above it. So because of that, we don't need to repeat it in the alt text. Mm -hmm. um, if the title wasn't there, it, I would probably include it. Mm -hmm. um, I put pie chart showing only a fraction. Um, you know, it doesn't actually need, maybe they don't need to care that it's a pie chart. It's just a chart showing that only a fraction of it is. Um, but some of these other ones were um, interesting. I thought some of them said, you know, like less than a third of the nation's million undergrads are traditional students. Um, that I, um, I think it could be still useful. Again, it's kind of that subjective um, part of it, but that could help show, again, kind of the main point um, of the chart. And then uh, the other ones were a little bit um, simpler, but here's one that you could go really in depth, or you could just say something like students learning in the classroom. Um, I think I, but something like students in a classroom looking at the teacher. Um, but, you know, in some of these, um, you know, while it might be useful, um, you definitely you might not need to share the perspective unless that was um, like part of the context of the image. And it is 1259, so I need to stop talking right now. Um, but Thank please you. let me know if you have more questions. I will do my best to answer them after um, or follow up with you. There are a few kind of remaining questions in the chat, and I think we can follow up with those after. But I hope you all will join me in thanking Jackie so much for sharing her expertise with us. Um, and thank you all for joining us. It's really nice to know that we're not alone in learning about um, open textbook publishing. We have um, each other to rely on. Um, one thing I wanted to pass along is that we do have homework for next week. Um, we're hoping that you will review the anti-racist documents and digital publishing YouTube video before the next time we meet. Um, so again, thank you all so much and we look forward to seeing you next week. Bye. Thank you. Bye.